Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let's do some problems. So here's the first problem. So suppose I have a finite group G. So let G be a finite group. And let K be a field. Okay, so recall this notion of uh, the group ring or the group algebra that we talked about. So the group ring is just, uh, what is it? Well, it's all elements of the form some linear combination with some coefficients c g with some basis elements 1 g you can think of it as a vector space over uh, uh, the field k uh, c g is coming from the scalars k okay uh, but the interesting thing as we saw is that this is a ring and it's got uh, multiplication which is well one way of describing it is to say if i take these two basis vectors 1 g and 1 h they multiply to give me the element 1 g h. Okay, so this is a ring. Uh, so recall this whole uh, business of opposites. Um, so recall what the opposite of a ring was. So if I have a ring R, not necessarily commutative, then R op is a new ring. Well, what is it? Well, it is firstly R as a set. Uh, in fact, it's R as an abelian group as well, the same plus so I'll say same plus as R, but the multiplication alone is the opposite. In other words, the new multiplication A into B in R op is just defined as the product B into A in R. Okay, And uh, we saw an example of uh, the matrix ring which was isomorphic to its opposite because there was this transpose map, right? A going to A transpose for a matrix, it sort of changes the order of multiplication. right? So that gives you an isomorphism between the matrix ring and its opposite. So the first problem now is to show that the same is true of Kg. Okay, so prove that Kg is isomorphic to its opposite. So this ring and its opposite ring are isomorphic to each other. So in this sense, it, it shares this property with the matrix ring. Okay, so let's see what we would do as in the case of matrices, the key point is to somehow try and guess what the, the map must be, something which uh, you know interchanges the order of um, uh, multiplication. And in the case of groups, so recall there is this uh, important property of groups that if I take the inverse of a product, then that has the effect of changing the order. Right? This is true if I have two elements of the group G and so that's somehow the, the clue. We define the following map. So here's the isomorphism. Let's define a map from the group ring KG to itself. As follows, we take the basis element 1 G to the basis element 1 sub G inverse okay, for all G and G. Of course, if I define it on the basis on a general element, it's defined just as a linear combination, right? So summation CG 1G, therefore, what I mean is that the map does the following. It takes this to CG 1G inverse, for all G uh, ranging over the group G. Okay, now the claim is that this, this map is a isomorphism between KG and KG opposite, sorry. So what's on the other side is, I'm thinking of it as the ring KG op. And I claim is that uh, this, this map psi is an isomorphism. So let's check all the properties. Claim psi is a ring isomorphism. So we need to check it preserves addition and multiplication. So addition is easy, okay? So because you know, at the level of vector spaces, it's it's just a, a, a vector space. It's a linear transformation of vector spaces, right? So summation CG1G goes to CG1G inverse. So psi preserves addition is easy to check. So, um, so psi of alpha plus beta equals psi alpha plus psi beta 
for all alpha, beta coming from kg. So I will leave this for you to check. All you have to use is this equation star by star. Okay, because both alpha and beta will have such expressions and you write everything out. The key point uh, that needs checking is really this multiplication. So if I take a product of two elements, if I take psi of alpha beta, then I want the answer to be psi beta psi alpha, right? Well, I mean, I, I want it to be psi alpha psi beta in kg op. I want this, right? So let's just check it on the basis elements. So let's take alpha to be the special element 1g, beta to be the element 1h, okay? Fix two elements g and h from g. Let's see whether this is at least true on um, the basis elements. So uh, when I compute psi on alpha beta, so first alpha beta becomes 1g into 1h, which by definition is 1gh. And therefore, psi acting on this element by definition was just 1gh inverse. Right? This is how psi acts. Now, on the other hand, let's compute psi alpha psi beta. Remembering that we are doing this, this multiplication inside kg op. So maybe I'll just put that funny symbol for multiplication to remind us that we are actually in the ring kg op. Let's go back for a second. So notice that the right hand side is uh, kg op. So I take psi alpha into psi beta. Uh, what is this? Well, psi of uh, alpha by definition is 1g and I need to do this multiplication in kg op with 1h. So what is, uh, uh, so, sorry, sorry, psi of uh, alpha is 1g inverse, psi of beta was 1h inverse right because alpha is 1g okay but now remember this is this multiplication is in the opposite ring which means it's the usual multiplication but in the opposite order so this is because everything is taking place in kg op and now we are done because that by definition uh, so now these two things are equal because let's check one of gh inverse by definition is one of so i know gh inverse in the group is h inverse g inverse and 1 sub h inverse 1 sub g inverse is also equal to 1 sub h inverse g inverse okay because this is now the multiplication in the ring r right so i have already done the opposite so i, I interchange the order of the factors and then i do the usual multiplication in the ring r okay so these two are of course equal so we are done okay and of course third property we need to check is that psi of the the identity is the the identity so recall that the identity of of i mean the multiplicative identity of this ring is uh, one sub the identity of the group okay so e is now the identity of the group identity element this is the multiplicative identity so if, if e is the identity element of the group then one sub e is the multiplicative identity of the ring of the ring k of g so now let's compute psi of 1 e by definition is 1 sub e inverse, but of course e inverse is e. Okay? So psi of 1 sub e goes to uh, 1 sub e again. So notice that 1 sub e is a multiplicative identity of kg as well as of kg op. Um, because the identity is always a two-sided identity, right? So whether you multiply it on the left or the right, it doesn't matter. It gives me the same, it, it, it serves the role of an identity. Okay, so I hope that's clear. So what we have established is that this ring kg op, if g is a finite group, the group ring is actually isomorphic to its opposite. Okay, and what does that mean? Well, as a consequence of uh, uh, this thing, you will probably see later that uh, right modules for kg op and uh, left modules of kg are the same thing. Okay, so uh, in if your ring is kg, then uh, right kg modules and left kg modules are really the same thing because uh, you can use this isomorphism to take a you know a, a left module over kg and convert it into a uh, right module over kg kg op uh, sorry a left module over kg via this isomorphism becomes a left module over kg op but a left module over kg op is just a right module over kg okay so this in in a sense the 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 uh, uh, conclusion or corollary of this isomorphism is that for kg uh, left and right modules are really equivalent notions we don't need to worry about 
left versus right. Okay. Let's move on to problem two, uh, which is again let's uh, define a notion for this problem. So define uh, an R module M is said to be simple. Is said to be simple. Okay, or a simple R module if it has no submodules, if uh, the only submodules of M submodules of M are the two obvious ones, zero and M itself. Okay, so these are the only two submodules. Then we say R is simple. Okay, it has no other non-trivial submodules. So now here's the question. So let's uh, do the following. Let's take the ring to be C x. C is a complex number. C x uh, and let let's uh, so as you've uh, uh, seen in the lectures, a, a module over C x is the same as a vector space over C. So let me take a, a vector space. So let V be a complex vector space, and let T be a linear operator on it. And we have seen that this, this data is the, well what does this, this data enable you to do? It, it makes V into a Cx module. So using this V becomes a Cx module. And what is the, the additional thing? You really need to specify how x acts and what we said is that the action of x on any vector is given by the, the operator T that you fixed. Right. So, this was recall how we make, uh, uh, I mean every Cx module is of this form. Okay, So, I, I fix a Cx module. Okay, In other words, I fix a complex vector space and a linear operator and think of V as a Cx module. Uh, prove that, this is simple, prove that uh, V is a simple Cx module. if and only if uh, the dimension of V is 1. Okay. So, need to prove that um, the only way in which V can be a, simply, uh, a simple CX module is if its dimension is 1. Okay. So, let us uh, let's prove this. One direction is easy. If the dimension is 1, then V is necessarily simple because recall what do uh, submodules look like. So, first observe the following Cx submodules of V are the same thing as T invariant subspaces. So, these are just subspaces T invariant subspaces of V. Okay, i.e. Uh, a subspace W of V which has the property that T maps it to itself. This is what a T invariant subspace means. Okay, so, uh, if the dimension of V is 1, so now let us prove one direction. So, let us prove this direction. If the dimension is 1, then of course, there are no subspaces other than 0 and the whole. Then there exists no uh, subspaces, not even talking about submodules here, there are even no subspaces of V other than 0 and 1, uh, 0 and the whole. Okay. So, of course, uh, there cannot be any uh, you know further submodules. Submodules are subspaces with an additional property, but there are no subspaces even, just 0 and the whole. So, of course, there are no submodules. So, there exists no subspace submodules even. There exists no Cx submodules of V other than 0 and V. So, this is trivial. It is the other direction that we need to work on. So, if it is simple, okay, you are given that it is a simple Cx module, then you need to show that the dimension has to be 1. Okay. Okay, now, let us just analyze what a, a submodule is. So, you are given it is simple, right, which means that it has no 
uh, Cx submodules other than 0 and the whole. Uh, what is the submodule? It is just a T invariant subspace. Right? So, what you are given is that this uh, subspace V, uh, sorry, this um, uh, complex vector space V has no T invariant subspaces. Right? That is what is given other than 0 and the whole. Okay? Uh, but here is an interesting property of a, a complex vector space. So, uh, I am thinking of everything here as a finite dimensional complex vector space. So, maybe I should have said that. Um, let V be a finite dimensional. So, in this case, I am okay. So, let V be finite dimensional. Finite dimensional complex vector space. Okay, and I am given T and let T from V to V be given. Um, Okay, so uh, T from V to V is a linear operator, V is a finite dimensional ve complex vector space, then here is one thing I know, uh, it always has an eigenvector. Okay, so observe this just implies that T always has an eigenvalue and an eigenvector. Right? At least one eigenvector is, is guaranteed to exist. Now, uh, so recall this fact from linear algebra. Now, what does that mean? Let us give that eigenvector a name. Let us call it V. So, V is some non-zero vector. Uh, when T acts on V, you just get some multiple of V right? for some lambda, which is what we call an eigenvalue for some lambda and C. Now, observe that the fact that when T acts on V, you get a multiple of V just means that the span of V. So, look at the complex span of V. So, I will just write it like this. C V is uh, T invariant, it is a T invariant subspace. This is a T invariant subspace of V. Okay. But the given hypothesis says that uh, there are no T invariant subspaces other than 0 and the whole, but we have clearly you know constructed at least one T invariant subspace here. This is not 0, it is not the 0 space. So, the only thing it can be is, is the whole, this implies that C V had better be the whole space. Okay, why? Since V is given to be a simple C X module, this is the given hypothesis. Okay, and now you are done because you have shown that V is just the span of a single vector, which means its dimension is exactly 1. Okay, so that is the end of this proof. Okay, uh, great. Um, here's an interesting follow-up question: Is the same true over R, the ring of uh, real numbers, the field of real numbers? Okay, so suppose I took, um, uh, you know, I, I took my ring to be R of x, and I took a real vector space. So remember, I use the fact that there are, uh, it's a complex vector space, so it has an eigenvalue, an eigenvector, and so on. Uh, so, here is sort of follow up question, let us call it question problem 2b, uh, does this hold over the real numbers? So, if V is a finite dimensional real vector space and T from V to V is some linear operator that is given and we, we think of V as an Rx module where x acts via the operator T. So, then the question is v is simple, suppose v is simple, does it imply that the dimension is 1? Okay. So, observe the same proof does not work anymore because uh, I do not necessarily have uh, you know eigenvalues anymore, I do not have real eigenvalues anymore. Uh, so, which means that I cannot necessarily produce an eigenvector and uh, therefore, the same proof would not work. But the question is, is the result true nevertheless? Can you somehow give a different proof of this fact? Now, uh, it turns out the result is not true in this case. Okay? So, here is the, the interesting observation. Uh, no, this is not true. A simple module need not have dimension 1 if you are over the real numbers. And what is a, uh, what's a very easy example? Well, we, we can just take V to be a two dimensional space. Okay, so, I, I just look at this two dimensional real vector space R2 and I take this linear operator T from V to V to be 
well i can i can just describe it geometrically let's take t to be the the map which is rotation uh, through 90 degree angle through pi by 2 angle say an anti clockwise rotation by a 90 degree angle yeah so what does it do uh, it rotates the plane by 90 degrees so which means for example the x axis here uh, maps to the y axis under the action of this uh, operator t okay and so on so any any other line that you pick uh, so if you took this line here for example uh, say at 45 degrees it will get rotated to the line which is at uh, 135 degrees and so on okay now uh, this is a linear operator okay as is easy to check and here's the interesting fact this linear operator has no t invariant subspaces okay this operator t has no invariant subspaces other than zero on the whole okay why is this because well the total dimension is 2 this is a zero dimensional subspace this is the two dimensional subspace what else can it have if at all it had a invariant subspace it must be a one dimensional space right so the question is uh, can t have a one dimensional invariant subspace what's a one dimensional subspace it's just a line okay so the question is if, can i just draw a line somewhere and say okay so let's say this one here uh, i draw a line now and say Let's just use some other color. So, so this is a line. Can this line be t invariant? Well, what does t do to this line? It doesn't map this line back to itself. It maps it to the line which is, you know, at a 90 degree angle to this one. Okay. So, just from the geometrical definition of t, it's clear that it cannot map any line to itself. It has to move every line and map it to a different line. Okay. So, here is a counter example if you are over the real numbers. Uh, even though this space has dimension 2, this operator is uh, such that, you know, V is still a simple module over Rx. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next problem. This is problem 3, which is uh, the following, um, again about simple modules if you wish. So, first uh, a little definition. So, suppose I have M, which is an R module. And if I take an element of m, x in m, then we call, so R x, by that I mean the space, what I get by multiplying x by all the scalars in R. Okay. This guy is called the cyclic submodule. So, this is by the way a submodule is called the cyclic submodule generated by x. It's just the submodule generated by x in some sense. So, if it's a singly generated submodule, we say uh, we usually call it cyclic. Uh, it's a cyclic submodule generated by x. Okay. Now, uh, here's the problem. Prove the following. Prove that m is a simple R module. Recall from the previous problem what that meant. m is simple. If and only if every cyclic submodule equals the whole module. So, by the way, you should check that this is a submodule, it is a it's an easy verification. But the claim is if m is simple, then uh, every cyclic submodule has to equal the whole. And this is an if and only if that is where the interest lies. So, let us prove this. Uh, one direction again is very easy. If m is simple, then recall that meant that it has no submodules other than zero and the whole, and here is a here is a submodule. Okay, so so I should say this is for x not zero, for all x in M other than zero. Right? Of course, if I take x equal to zero, it just generates the zero submodule. So uh, if M is simple, then R x is a submodule, and R x is not zero. 
because I have chosen x to be not 0. Therefore, Rx had better equal the whole because there are no other submodules. Okay? So, this is by simplicity of m, by simplicity of m. Now, it is the converse that really needs work here. If uh, every cyclic submodule equals the whole, why is it true that m must be simple? Okay, so, let us prove that m is simple. So, uh, what does it mean? Suppose not. So, why do not we, we proceed by contradiction? So, suppose m is not simple. Suppose uh, m is not simple. That means, what does that imply? That means, I can find a submodule. There exists a submodule n. Um, of m such that n is neither 0 nor the whole. So, it is sort of strictly properly between these two ends. So, there exists a submodule n which is neither 0 nor m. Uh, from this, I need to get a contradiction somehow. Okay? So, well, let us do the following. So, since n is not 0, let us pick, pick an element, a non-zero element from n. So, pick x not 0, x in n. Okay, so, take a non-zero element of n and consider the cyclic submodule generated by that non-zero element. Look at Rx. Okay, consider Rx. Now, uh, what do we know? Every cyclic submodule is supposed to be the whole module m. But since x comes from n and n is a submodule, right? what does it mean? If you multiply x, so x is from n and I multiply x by any scalar, the answer is again in n because n is a submodule. Okay? So, observe uh, if I take the cyclic submodule generated by Rx, because x is in n and n is a submodule, Rx is a sub of n. Okay? But n is, a, n, n is not the whole space, n is a strict subset of m. So, this means in particular that the cyclic submodule Rx cannot equal m and that is a contradiction. Okay, and that contradiction proves what we want. 